the Ukrainians are able are, are mowing them down um, and their men are not allowed to deviate um, because particularly the Storm Z people, because they're convicts and they say, and as Wagner used to say to them, you will go forward along the line we prescribe for you. If you deviate from that line, we'll shoot you. If you come back or retreat, we will shoot you. If you disobey an order, we will shoot you. And they do. And so these poor guys have got no choice but to carry on to you know, that tree line, to the left of that tree line or the right of that tree line, exactly as they've been told to do. And once the Ukrainians can see what they're going to do, they just hose that area and they, no, nobody makes it. Nobody makes it to their objectives. By the spring of next year, I confidently predict that the Russians will be on well, well over half a million casualties. Hello and welcome to Frontline for Times Radio with me, Kate Chabot. And today we are catching up with the highly respected Professor of Defence Studies, Michael Clark. Professor Clark is a former Director General of the British think tank, Rusi. He's a prolific writer, his most recent publication being Britain's Persuaders, Soft Power in a Hard World. He's also a defence analyst for Sky News and BFBS SITREP and has, of course, made many appearances on Times Radio. Uh, Michael Clark, welcome back to Frontline. Good to see you. Yeah, thanks, Kate. It's always nice to be here. Always nice to talk to you on this. Absolutely. And we spoke um, last time on Frontline back in May about the war in Ukraine, and there was intense speculation at the time about the counteroffensive, where it would be, when it would be, when it was getting underway. How do you view the balance of power along the front line in this war now? Well, there's no doubt that uh, the counteroffensive, Ukraine's counteroffensive, has been disappointing from their point of view and the point of view of the Western world. And I expected it to be able to achieve more territorially. Um, they didn't break through Russian lines in the south. I thought they would achieve a breakthrough somewhere. But the question was whether they would exploit that breakthrough. But they didn't make a breakthrough. Um, but they have made some real progress in the Western Black Sea because they've made the western part of the Black Sea unusable for Russia's Black Sea fleet. So, and they've put Crimea under some sort of threat, and they'll be able to increase that threat, I think, in the months to come. But that's a bit of a consolation prize. It's an important consolation prize, because it gives Ukraine now a corridor, a trade corridor from Odessa down to the Bosphorus, because the Russians now find it difficult to, inter to intercept ships going back and forth, and there are more ships doing that now. So that's very important to Ukraine. But in terms of throwing the Russians out, of liberating the territory which the, which the Russians have seized, there's no question that the uh, offensive did not achieve what the Ukrainians wanted. And though the Russians can't mount their own big offensive, they're pushing all across the line and they're paying massively for it in terms of casualties. But they're particularly pushing at uh, Marinka and Avdivka. And the Russians may achieve a bit more territorial control over the winter because Ukraine is running low on ammunition and the Russians are uh, out producing them, at least on the ammunition front at the moment, because the Russians are getting a lot of ammunition from North Korea and Iran. So that the tactical balance is shifting back towards the Russians over the winter. Strategically, both of them are kind of stuck now into the campaign such as they may be for 2024. And as the year draws to a close, both President Putin and President Zelensky have held end of year press conferences. And for Putin, notably, it's the first end of year press conference he's given since the full scale invasion. What are your takeaways from those press conferences? Yeah, the press conferences were interesting because they, they sort of created an atmosphere. So Putin seemed to be very chipper and confident, very smooth. And remember, this comes off the back of him visiting uh, United Arab Emirates and, Ab uh, and um, in Abu Dhabi and uh, also Saudi Arabia, which was the first time he'd really been outside his own fairly close sphere and, um, you know, raises questions about the International Criminal Court and its jurisdiction in countries that haven't fully signed up to it and so on. So he was quite confident and he was saying, well, yes, of course, you know, the, the operation goes on. It's of course, it's it's tougher, but the special military operation will succeed and we'll achieve all our objectives in the near future, though he didn't say next year. And Zelensky, by contrast, was uh, rather tetchy. He's clearly tired and exhausted. I mean, all war leaders, you know, are really tired after about two years. I mean, Churchill was extremely exhausted uh, after two, two and a half, three years and started to become un started to become unpopular. And that's happening to Zelensky as well. So there, is a, there was a marked difference in atmosphere, although Zelensky was just as defiant in his press conference as Putin was confident in his. But I would caution against reading too much into the personal 
uh, as it were, personal appearances of the two leaders. The underlying conditions are that this is going to be a longer term struggle between the industrial power of Russia, which has gone over to a war economy and is now going to start to pay the price for that in terms of what it will what it will not be able to do and all of the domestic programs and welfare and health that it's giving up on in order to make war. And on the other hand, the, the ability of Ukraine to gear up a, a, a new war economy and in the meantime be supported by the Western powers. Now, I don't know how that balance is going to play out, but that's the underlying reality and the as it were, that the tone that is set by leaders is really a little bit of candy floss on the top of that underlying reality. Um, and it's not unimportant. It's not un uninteresting. We always want to talk about it. But um, we shouldn't be um, misled by that to assume that, that that accounts for the way the war is going. The war will go the way industrial warfare goes. The side that will prevail is the side that can mobilize and deploy its whole societal power to the nature of the war. Yeah, and one thing that struck me about what Zelensky was saying at, at that conference, though, was his insistence of the need for daily results from the battlefield. And he was questioned uh, more than once about his relations with his commander-in-chief, Zeluzhny, General Zeluzhny, um, whether he would sack him or not, uh, and also this sensitive issue of this request uh, to mobilise up to 500,000 more people. Um, what, what kind of pressures do you think are the most pressing on Zelensky at the moment? Yeah, I mean, he's got, his, he's got a governmental problem on his hands um, because w one thing, they've, they've cancelled elections f due for next year that were due in Ukraine for next year. And that, I have to say, is entirely sensible because, you know, to, to hold national elections when four of your provinces are substantially under foreign control and and the fact that the russians would interfere massively in an election and it would make it unsafe you know people queuing up at a a, a, a polling station will be targeted by russian missiles um so it it makes perfect sense not to have elections next year but of course that means that um zelensky has got to re-legitimize himself at least for another year I mean, they can't put elections back more than one year, really, and they're going to have to face all those issues I've just raised in 2025, probably. But it makes sense to put it back while you can. And he has to really justify himself. And he does have a, a, an issue, apparently, with Zuluzny, the commander in chief. And it is said that at some point he will uh, sack Zuluzny. And, and, and that's not unusual in wars. Generals get sacked all the time. And General Sersky, who is the ground forces commander, who is close to Zelensky, may well step up into Zelensky's place. Now, you know, if that happens and when it happens become key issues. Some have said, well, if the Ukrainians lose Avdivka, which would be a, a fairly important loss tactically, that might be the moment when he would say to Zelensky, well, you've got to step down. Um, on the other hand, if Zelensky then goes into, as it were, outright opposition to Zelensky, and Zelensky is pretty popular with the uh, Ukrainian public, then that would be a danger to Zelensky. So he's he's got to get over this governmental crisis that he's got. He's also got Klitschko, the mayor of, of uh, Kiev, uh, criticizing him openly. And you know Klitschko's office and Zelensky's office are only a, you know a, a short walk apart. They're a couple of minutes walk away from each other, and yet they never meet, they never talk. And that seems very strange. Mm -hmm. And the argument is that Zelensky has become isolated, autocratic. He is tired. He's he's tetchy. He doesn't like criticism anymore. That's what he's being said. And I think he's got to get over that. And I think maybe he could re legitimize himself with, a, 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 as it were, a refreshed national government. And it is better to have your opponents inside the tent than outside. Um, but and somehow he's got to get over this and he's got to get over it at a time when the Western world is becoming more skeptical that Ukraine can prevail in this war. He's very confident, Zelensky, that he will do it. But I think all sensible people know this won't be quick. This is going to be a fairly long war because, as you and I have discussed a few times already, this is the return of industrial warfare to Europe. And that's never over quickly. Yeah. And you, as you mentioned earlier, uh, Russia being on this industrial war footing and, and the pressures that, that Zelensky is under with the West's uh, perhaps being a little cynical as to, to how, how well Ukraine is doing. And his recent trip to the US to unlock that $62 billion in military aid, it failed. EU money is also stalling. How long do you think Ukraine can keep going in its war for liberation with these kind of holdups? 
it can go for a little while, but not for too much longer. I mean, the, the money it needs, it needs by the end of January because it has to pay governmental salaries just to keep the government going in a, in a state of war is very difficult. Having said that, the IMF reckon that Ukraine um, has achieved something like a 3% growth rate during the first two years of the war because lots of production is taking place. I mean, it may be war production, but it's still production. And um, they're thinking in terms of, you know, 2.5% to 3% for the coming year. So it isn't that Ukraine is going bankrupt. It is growing. It's, it's still quite a strong and powerful economy with a great deal of potential, huge potential, as and when the war may be over. But um, undoubtedly, Ukraine needs the cash. It needs to produce war materials. It needs to be able to buy war materials. And it needs to pay governmental salaries and just keep the functioning of government going because, you know, in a situation where you've got, you know, half a million to three quarters of a million active uh, young and not so young men in the armed services, then the tax take is down. Um, <coughs> Ukraine will finds it difficult to keep its own revenues coming in. And to be honest, to be fair, it looks as if Ukraine doesn't really have very good statistics anymore about the functioning of its own economy, certainly in the agriculture sector, partly because of the war, because of the, of the destruction. They don't know, for instance, how much of next year's harvest has been planted. They know what they've had this year, but nobody can give you a reliable figure for what they've planted and where they've planted it for next year. And so governmental information has has not quite broken down, but it's not doing very well. And so it's, it's, it's hard for Ukraine to maintain the functions of a modern government without regular cash injections to keep um, civil servants working uh, productively so they know what they're doing. So, yeah, this money is important. Ukraine will carry on the war with or without the money, but it will become a different sort of war for them. Um, not a war to throw the Russians out, but a war to resist Russian encroachments on any more territory. If we could just um, talk about a couple of, of uh, lines that have been coming out about, about the front line. Um, Ukraine's main intelligence directorate has reported an outbreak of so-called mouse fever uh, among Russian units in Kupiansk. What is mouse fever and how much of a risk is uh, of serious illness during the winter period? Yeah, I mean, there's different, there's different ways of expressing mouse fever. Um, it, it's essentially, it's, it what, it's what comes out of bad maintenance and poor hygiene and poor medical support in the trenches, in the mud uh, and so on. And you, you end up with um, uh, picking up all sorts of infections um, through just living the way you do. I mean, fighting through a winter or being dug in through a winter really emphasizes the difference between a well-organized force that's properly fed, properly clothed, where people are rotating in and out of frontline trenches, as opposed to those who are relatively neglected and just left to fend for themselves. And um, it's not surprising that the uh, that Russian trenches um, or Russian dug in positions and, it's, and they've been dug in around Kupians for a long time uh, because that's where the Russians were trying to make a push quite early on uh, in the summer and they haven't got very far at all. And so they really are stuck and it's pretty muddy and it's now very cold there. So I'm not surprised to hear all this. Um, I mean, winter is a miserable time for everybody on the battlefield, but the side that is better organised comes through winter rather better. And just as an example, you know, during the, the trenches of the First World War, turned out to be remarkably healthy places in a strange sort of way. I mean, it, it, apart from the effects of war, if you didn't get shot or, or bombed, living in the trenches was not particularly unhealthy because the men were well cared for in the ways that I'd described. The, the two issues that they had in the trenches persistently were trench foot and venereal disease. And you only caught one of them in the trenches. Um, the, in other respects, mm. the trenches were, as, were healthier than anybody ever thought they would be because the army in, in the, the First World War was pretty well organised in that respect. So do you think we're going to see, though, if you look at the situation in Ukraine, that, that the, these instances of disease outbreaks are going to continue and impact on the effectiveness of Russian forces? We don't know how widespread these sort of fever outbreaks uh, are. I wouldn't be surprised if they are quite widespread, simply because we know that Russia's frontline forces are really badly um, provided for because they're not their main forces. Their elite forces are behind the lines and they put their Storm Z people, uh, who are the, um, uh, the convicts, um, and some of their, you know, the Mobics, the recently mobilized, the, the uh, mobilized units, the conscripts, they put them in the front lines to act as a screen and as, as just human fodder, to cannon fodder, really. Um, and so I'm not at all surprised that there are, there will be outbreaks of illness. And, you know, will it diminish 
Russia's combat capability. Yes, it will to some extent. More importantly, it reduces the morale of Russian forces, and and that seeps through into Russian society. You know, with with about three hundred fifty thousand casualties, that's dead and wounded already, and heading way past. You know, in, by the spring of next year, I confidently predict that the Russians will be on well well over half a million casualties. All of those people have got families. And being told that this is a special military operation, this is not war, it's it's necessary and so on. The, the messages coming out of the Kremlin are completely contradictory. That on the one hand, what is going on in Ukraine is a special military operation. On the other hand, Russia, the very existence of Russia and Russian culture is being threatened by the West through the Ukraine um, conflict. I mean, those are totally contradictory messages. And I think that during next year, as the Russians find they're having to pay quite heavily now for this war. They haven't so far, but next year they'll start to pay for it. Um, that too, the, the, the problems on the very front line will filter through into a dissatisfaction. And how that will be expressed, we just don't know, but I'm sure it will be there and I'm sure it will increase. Um, we learned this week that Russia had fired a Killjoy hypersonic missile at Ukraine for the first time since the summer. Mm. Um, and the MOD confirmed its use when Russian jets attacked Kyiv and the Starokotskyantyevniv, if I can say it correctly, military air base. Um, how much better are Ukraine's air defences this winter compared to last? Yeah, the Killjoy, the Kinzhal missile, the hypersonic. It's it's not really a hypersonic missile, but it's one of the one of the big missiles that the Russians have got. They thought they were unstoppable, but actually they have been stopped in the past. And what Ukraine has got now, more so than the last winter, but they'll need it to be better than last winter is a multi-layered system. So they've got a series of systems. They've got things like, the, you know, down at the lowest level, the Gepard system from Germany, which is like a sort of a really, really rapid uh, machine gun that can just sort of bring down drones. And that's very good for bringing down cheap drones. And then they've got things like uh, American NASAMS, N-A-S-A-M-S, the NASAM system, which is a good anti-missile system. They've got the, um, the Iris T um, with, from Germany. That's an anti-missile system. Right up to the Patriot. Now, the Patriot batteries, they've got three batteries now, two German batteries and an American one. And the Patriot batteries will bring down just about everything, anything. Every battery has eight launchers and it includes about 60 missiles. The issue for Patriot is that a Patriot missile, the actual missile costs about $10 million. Every battery costs a billion, a billion, about 400 million for the, the, the launchers and the radars and 600 million for the actual missiles that it fires. Now, firing a, a, a $10 million missile at a, a Shahid 136 Iranian drone, which cost $20,000, is not a clever idea. And so you, you, what Ukraine has got to do, and they are doing it, is save their Patriot shots for the ballistic missiles, those, those aimed at Kiev, like the Kinzhal, that's worth a, a Patriot shot. Use it for that, and it's important to bring them down. What the Russians are hoping is that if they can overwhelm this multi-layered system with cheap drones, They'll make the Ukrainians fire off more expensive missiles up to the Patriot battery and leave holes in their ammunition stocks. The, their ballistic missiles so, can then come through. And there is quite a lot of evidence so far that the Russians are holding back um, several hundred powerful ballistic missiles. And they're firing off cheaper missiles and drones, hoping to run down Ukrainian stocks over the winter. And if they can find some gaps in Ukraine's ammunition, and they might if we don't supply them, then believe me, they'll pour and ballistic missiles through onto Ukraine sometime in the coldest time of the winter and really try to hurt them uh, more so than they did last year. I don't think they'll succeed, but that is what they're undoubtedly planning to try. Um, so, Mike, you've, you've written an article that's appearing in the Sunday Times about uh, the revolution in drone warfare. Mm. Um, there have been reports overnight uh, of drone attacks on Ukraine by Russia from three directions. 34 of the 35 drones said to have been shot down. How would they have been taken out, as it were? Yeah, they've been taken out by the, by the lower level systems. I think the Ukrainians have become quite good now at, at assessing what's coming in and putting the right sort of weapon against it. And that's the whole idea. I mean, get, maybe let the Iris T's deal with them, let the Nazams deal with them, even the Gepards, if you can. And if, it, if you're talking about Shahid 136 drones traveling reasonably slowly, not, not particularly fast, you can bring those down with the Gepard um, as long as you can track them early enough. And some will get through. But I mean, in general, is, um, uh, Ukraine's um, ability to shoot down drones has been and missiles has been up in the 85, 90 percent level. Um, you know, if it dropped to 60 percent, 
which would still be quite a good percentage, that would be unacceptable because, you know, the number of drones and missiles getting through, if you're only at 60 percent attrition rate, would actually disable the um, the whole electrical system and the energy system. And that's what the Ukrainians are going to try and do is to hold together. I mean, last year, they, lo they lost about 50 percent of their whole infrastructure system and have rebuilt most of it over the over time but um they could lose you know more than 50 percent of it this winter if they can't get it right in bringing the, in using the right weapon against the sort of things that the russians are going to throw at them and the russians will play games um you know they'll 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 look as if they're sending drones and then they'll send some ballistic missiles um and that's i think is partly what the kinzel was up to to see if they can actually run down some of the patriot rounds that ukraine is obviously values the most because patriots don't don't miss they're a very very good system and what impact are you noticing on the resupply pressures that they're having on both the ukrainian and the russian forces yeah the biggest um, issue is is really ammunition um it's mainly artillery ammunition um the the russians have, have built up more of their 152 millimeter artillery ammunition they've got i mean while while we in europe you know, we, we promised a million rounds of the NATO standard 155 millimetres. We promised a million rounds. We've only delivered 300,000. And European leaders are now saying, well, a million was always a bit unrealistic. And I say, well, why did you say it then if it was unrealistic? However, they did. And so we've delivered a third of what we promised. Meanwhile, the Russians have, got, have had a million 152 millimetre rounds in three months from North Korea. Hmm. They're also getting 152s from Iran and they're getting... Um, multiple thousands of drones, the, the Shahid 136 drone from Iran. Um, so the Russians are actually, they depend now on other countries for their ammunition stocks, and they're getting them. Um, the Ukrainians find that they're, they're really running, running low now on, on um, artillery shells. So whereas the, the Ukrainians were firing off seven and 8,000 a day um, a couple of months ago, they're now firing off fewer than 4,000 a day, and they're having to... Um, ration the number of shells they can fire while the Russians are pouring yeah. in um, artillery fire at the moment. That's why it's so tough for the Ukrainians. You know, they can outfight the Russians on any front, you know, man for man, vehicle for vehicle, they can outfight them. But they can't, as it were, outdo them on artillery if they don't have the, uh, the ammunition. And that's the biggest, the biggest problem at the moment. And, of course, the Gaza war is taking away some of the American ammunition that was destined for Ukraine is now going to Israel. And so the Ukrainians have found that they, at least 30% uh, of their the, the, the material they were being supplied has just disappeared since the beginning of October. So they're 30% down on all American supplies across the board. And it's felt mainly, most significantly on the front line in artillery shells. You mentioned that the war in Gaza, and we've often heard the, the mantra repeated that, that Putin's strategy is to keep the war going until Ukraine's Western backers lose interest. With that new uh, crisis, the Israel-Gaza war, um, threatening to preoccupy Ukraine's backers and, and divert support, as you, you mentioned, how is President Putin seeking to capitalise on that? What kind of opportunity does he see it as? He's capitalising on it um, quite handsomely from his point of view at the moment, partly by as it were, letting Israel stew in its own juice in, in Gaza, partly by um, playing, playing Netanyahu for a fool, which at the moment is not very difficult, um, by um, talking about uh, calling for peace, um, by lining up with the, the global south and saying we've got to have a ceasefire, which means that Hamas gets away with the crime of, of October the 7th. And that puts America, it isolates America, makes, makes America's support for Israel more and more costly, politically costly for the United States. So Putin is, is gaining credibility with the wider world. And that credibility is for Russia's policy, which also reflects, therefore, on Russia's policy in Ukraine. He's gaining distraction of American politicians and America's effort uh, towards Israel. And um, he's also gaining uh, the, the opportunity, in a sense, to to order his generals to push all around Ukraine, you know, regardless of the cost. He's ordering them into some of these crazy offensives like Marinka and Avdivka. And it's astonishing when you when you read the daily accounts, as I do, of what the Russians have been doing in the last 24 hours, the the wanton you know, stupidity of what they're sending their men into is quite 
astonishing, to be honest. And he's ordering or making sure that his military order that they push everywhere all at once while this distraction lasts. It won't last forever. And this, but this distraction will certainly go into the new year for probably a month or so before whatever is going to happen in Gaza takes a new turn as the military operation is probably de-intensified by the Israelis. It won't be ended, but it'll, it'll drop down in levels of intensity. And when Gaza goes off the front pages a little bit, um, then attention will swing back to Ukraine. But by then, Putin hopes that his army will be on the front foot during the winter and will be able maybe to take the whole of the Donbass uh, by the spring before the Ukrainians are able to do anything about it. That's, I'm sure, is what he hopes. You mentioned that the wanton stupidity that, that Putin is asking his soldiers uh, to, to undertake. Can you, what, what struck you as the most stupid thing they've been asked to do? Well, the, I mean, they, they've uh, dismounted their uh, armour, so they're sending you know, groups of men in, on foot in small units. Um, they're, they're not, because it's, it's hard for them to fan out uh, at the moment, they're moving on sort of fixed paths. So if the Ukrainians only had enough ammunition, they could they could take them to pieces because it's fairly obvious where they're coming from. Even so, when they get close to the Ukrainians, the Ukrainians are able are, are mowing them down um, and their men are not allowed to deviate um, because particularly the Storm Z people, because they're convicts and they say, you know, as Wagner used to say to them, you will go forward along the line we prescribe for you. If you deviate from that line, we'll shoot you. If you come back or retreat, we will shoot you. If you disobey an order, we will shoot you. And they do. And so these poor guys have got no choice but to carry on to you know, that tree line, to the left of that tree line or the right of that tree line, exactly as they've been told to do. And once the Ukrainians can see what they're going to do, they just hose that area and they, no, nobody makes it. Nobody makes it to their objectives. And so they are literally expending multiple thousands of lives for the sake of 50 metres of, uh, you know, capturing a tree line. Now, you know, there may be a point because of the ammunition deficiencies which the Ukrainians suffer from where they have to withdraw and the Russians will suddenly walk, you know, five or six kilometres and surround Avdivka and they've got it because the Ukrainians will have to leave. That's possible. But, the, I mean, the battle for the coke plant in the north of Avdivka at the moment, this godforsaken coke plant, um, is something like Verdun in, uh, in, the in 1916 in the First World War. And the Russians have, have gone at it and gone at it and gone at it. First of all, they tried to bomb it. Then they tried to take it with tanks. Then they tried to take it with dismounted troops. Now they're trying to just take it with human wave attacks. And although the Ukrainians are absolutely exhausted in the coke plant, they're still holding it. Um, just to uh, return to the Middle East for a moment, Michael, um, Operation Prosperity Guardian, led by the US, is this new task force of 10 countries to protect shipping in the Red Sea yeah. after several attacks by Houthi rebels from Yemen. Reported now that the US may is considering strikes against them in Yemen itself. Um, given Russia's relationship with Iran and Iran does back the Houthis, does Russia have any influence in this at all? They, they have influence with Iran, uh, with the Iranians. Again, the, the Russians and the Iranians have made a sort of Faustian pact. Um, the, there's, there's nothing necessarily coincident about their long-term interests, but in the short term, they've decided to work together much more closely. And so it, it certainly suits um, Putin that the Iranians are prepared to allow the Houthis to take pot shots at everything going through the, the, through the Straits into the Red Sea um, around you know, the Gulf of Aden and so on. Um, whether Tehran is in full control of the Houthis, I'm not entirely certain, um, but certainly they influence them and they provide the, the ammunition. I mean, that, interestingly, the Iranians have provided to the Houthis the Fatah 110 ballistic missile that they haven't given to the Russians. <laughs> you know, the Russians have asked them for the Fatah 110 and the Iranians so far, they've given them a lot of drones. They won't give them the ballistic missile, but they've given that to their Houthi friends who are lobbing it, you know, either at shipping or towards Eilat in southern Israel, I mean, 750 miles up the Red Sea. So um, one view is that what the Houthis are trying to do is provoke the United States into attacking them in order to draw the US into mm -hmm. what would then be an unpopular operation that the global south would find um, unacceptable and so on. That's one view. The other view is that they really just do fancy their chances at closing the straits into the Red Sea and therefore um, as it were, gr gaining some political traction from the fact that they can control entrance into the Red Sea. 
Now, the United States is clear they won't do that. Britain is joining that as well. HMS Diamond is part of this uh, task force. Although 10 nations are talked about in the task force so far, uh, the Britain, France, United States and possibly Bahrain are the only active members of it. There's a, there's a Bahraini vessel on its way. Um, but that's it. I mean, it may, be, may have 10, 10 members, but it's only got three active members. And of course, the United States is far and away the most important. But what I think we'll see in the Red Sea, and this all comes down to destroyers. Uh, destroyers have the air defense assets. I mean, they're very good at, at using air defense missiles. That's what they do. You know, they're quite small ships, destroyers, but they're very powerful. And the Americans have got three active destroyers there now, the air defense, the Arleigh Burke uh, class um, uh, air defense vessels. We've got HMS Diamond. The French have got a, um, a frigate there, um, which has got some of those capabilities. So what we'll see is a number of allied countries, destroyers, sitting around up and down the 700 miles of the Red Sea, acting as a sort of layered air defense to protect shipping, but also to protect Israel from attacks into southern Israel from Yemen itself. And it's going to get very complicated. It, it, it may turn out to be a sort of a tanker war because it's very important for the Western powers to be able to say to world shipping, look, we will keep the Red Sea safe. And the danger is that at some point, if they if they can't convince world shipping that they can use the Red Sea, and, and you know, if they can't use it, then costs go up and the, it hurts the world economy quite considerably, actually. If they can't use the Red Sea, then the temptation will be, OK, we'll just have to take the Houthis out. And then uh, the Americans and its allies find themselves, as they were, getting involved in the war in Yemen, which will be a, a new ball game. Yeah, and on that note, um, I know it's almost difficult to say, but if you were to compare um, the war in Ukraine with the potential for for conflict in the Red Sea area and mm. what's going on in Israel and Gaza, which do you see as the biggest risk to global security? Undoubtedly, to my view, it's Ukraine. Um, the, the, what's going on in the Middle East may well remake the map of the, the regional map of the Middle East, and that will be pretty important. But what's going on in Ukraine is more globally significant because it is the fundamental challenge of the dictatorship of Putin, backed up by the dictatorship of Xi Jinping, and dictators and criminal gangsters all around the world are watching to see what happens. And so whether we like it or not, you know, the Western world has committed itself to the, uh, to the defense of Ukraine. And if after all we've said for two years, we're in it for as long as it takes, we will not allow Ukraine to be occupied. We, are, we insist that we will make sure that Putin loses. After all we've said, if we can't back up that with effective action, if we're, if we're unable to continue these brave words, back up these brave words after two years, then the rest of the world will take note. And the era of Western influence will be over. It's as simple as that. Um, and the 21st century... You know, will go down not as the century of liberal democratic world order as the 20th century largely was. Uh, it'll go. It'll be the century, the new dark age, as I call it, of um, of dictatorship and gangsterism. And we're moving towards that at the moment. So the, the 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 war in Ukraine is globally more important than what happens in the Middle East. Even though what happens in the Middle East normally we would say is pretty dramatic. And. Against that backdrop, how is President Putin trying to stoke divisions and open up new fronts elsewhere in the world? Yeah, I mean, his, his ability to do that physically is relatively limited because he's having to devote all of his military machinery to the war in Ukraine, which is absorbing it all. However, Russia is very good at, at fighting, as it were, total campaign, much better than we are, though we understand what he's doing. We're not able to imitate it so easily because we're open and free societies. But the Russians use everything. They use every sort, sort of subversion, every sort of propaganda, every sort of cyber criminality, ransomware. We, we talk about a lot. One of the committees I work with in Parliament has just done a big report on ransomware. And most of the ransomware, you know, traces it. You can trace it back to Russia to former Soviet Union territories or North Korea. They know what they're doing. So the, 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 the technique, I think, and what we'll see from Putin is although his army is fully occupied in, in Ukraine, we will see Russian interference and subversion anywhere in the world where he thinks he can distract the West, cause problems for the West, diminish Western influence, uh, give the West something else to worry about. I mean, he's got plenty to, that he should worry about in his own sphere of influence as he sees it in Georgia 
um, in, in, uh, in, in the Baltic states in relation to Moldova. Um, you know, he's got a lot to worry about. However, um, he will actually try to make 2024 a really difficult year for the Western powers. And the Russians have the, the breadth of policy instruments that we don't have to actually implement that, to actually do something about it. They've got more levers to pull to create problems than we have. In Ukraine, President Putin's state, his ambitions remain unchanged. Denazification of Ukraine, as he calls it, uh, demilitarization and neutral status. Whereas Zelensky also in no mood to compromise on the restoration of Ukraine's pre-1991 borders. Um, there will be no peace negotiations anytime soon. Um, what do you predict for 2024? I think 2024 is going to be um, a bit like 1942 was in the Second World War. Um, it's a year of, con after early battles and a sort of a, 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 a creation of a front line or a, a situation, <clears throat> I think we'll see consolidation on both sides. Neither Ukraine nor Russia is likely to be capable of a strategic offensive until 2025. The, the Ukrainians might be capable of something during 2024 if the West is prepared to supply them properly. Um, but if the West isn't prepared to supply them, the Ukrainians will hunker down and get through 2024 while the Russians build up. And so I think it'll be it'll be one of these stasis years. Undoubtedly, there'll be things that surprise us and the Ukrainians intend there to be some surprises. I think the Ukrainians have a good opportunity to isolate Crimea and cause Putin real strategic problems in Crimea. That won't win the war for them, but it will be a considerable strategic bonus that they will take into any offensive that they can then operate uh, toward the end of the year or more likely in, in 2025. So I think 2024 is a bit like 1942. You know, wars can't be regarded as boring. But a lot of people said 1942 was quite a boring year in the Second World War because it was that year of transition between losing, losing, losing all the time for the Western world from 1939 to 1942. And then by the end of 1942, winning, winning, winning all the way through to 1945. Um, whether 2024 will be like that for the Ukrainians, we don't know. But it has that feel about it, a year of, of preparation, expectation and worry. This week, that the former um, Foreign Secretary William Hague, he wrote in the Times um, that next year presents a pivotal moment in the war, um, which he says more than anything else that might happen in 2024, the huge number of elections, the path of interest rates, the rows over migration, that this will decide the fate of Europe and the future of the West. Then is he right, do you think? Absolutely. I agree with every word of that. And, and I, I mean, I, that's one of the things I've been saying is that the, the future of the war will be largely as it were, determined next year by what happens in Washington, in Moscow, in Beijing, in Tehran, uh, in Brussels, in London, and not by what happens in, in Tokmak, in Kramatorsk, in Svatove, uh, Kramina. The front, the front line will be the front line, which is not to say that it's not worth fighting for, it is. But the strategic direction of the war will come down to whether the West is prepared to back up everything it said in the last two years, or whether actually we don't have the, the wherewithal or the courage or the vision to do what is in our own best interests. And that's what the dictators and the gangsters are banking on, that ultimately, just the way the, the dictators in the 1930s saw the democracies, they were so contemptuous, they thought these people talk big things, they never do it. Well, eventually, in the 1930s, we did do it. Um, whether we'll do it again in this century is now the big question. Michael Clark, Professor Michael Clark, good to speak to you. Thank you so much for your time. Pleasure. You've been watching Frontline for Times Radio. My thanks to Louis Sykes, our producer. To support the work of Frontline, hit the subscribe button. You can also listen to Times Radio throughout the day or read it at times.co.uk. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.